Okay, so now let's look at the flip side before continuing on. You're Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In fellowship, learning and living on Bible, you become more competent and indeed a benefit to the human race, even by human standards. Although the human race will not like you. That's always true of heroes anyhow. When you are more competent than another person, um, generally speaking, um, you become a polarizing factor. The people who appreciate what abilities you have, and especially those who want to use them, will, you know, praise you, be nice to you, etc. Okay? You'll get better jobs. The people who feel jealous or resentful that you have better abilities than they do, even if they could get those abilities themselves by, you know, applying themselves, um, they will become gradually or quickly your enemies. They will feel compelled to... um, I'm going to call it crusade in some manner against you. You won't necessarily know who these people are, and they will be members of your own family. That's the sad part. That's what Christ was talking about when he said, mother will be against daughter, and everybody's going to divide over me. This is one of the things that Christianity doesn't understand when it talks about Christian unity. There is no such thing. There shouldn't even be such a thing. It, the, the whole definition of unity in the Bible is unity with God, not people. The Greek word is chanotes, and it's in Ephesians 4 5. It's been used as a t- tyranny device by the Catholic Church. In other words, well, we're all supposed to be in unity under Mother Church. Uh huh, that's a bid for tyranny. Okay, Christian unity is a sham, and you don't even want it. And there's so many verses in the Bible that warn you against this. Okay? You're not supposed to sit there and say that you're better than another believer because, you know, that's 1 Corinthians 1. Oh, I was baptized by Cleopas. I was baptized by Paul, so I'm better than you. Well, that's not supposed to be the kind of division it is either. But you're not looking for agreement with your fellow Christian. That's exactly the opposite of what you should do. You're looking for agreement with God. Okay, but one of many forms of doc- of Mr. Hyde is this sweetness and light garbage that so characterizes Christianity. Oh, we're being loving to our fellow brother, yada yada. Okay, but see, that's the point. The flip side is, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, the Christian is going to be more incompetent than his unbeliever counterpart. And the Christian brings cursing to the world when he's in his Mr. Hyde mode. That's Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So if God were arbitrary... then he's arbitrarily causing cursing to the human race by having this policy of you, you know, you're a Christian, you're in me, I will bless the world due to you, and I will curse the world due to you. Okay? Because he knows full well that we're all going to get into our Mr. Hyde mode. Why should the rest of the world suffer due to that? Well, but Start thinking now about the rest of the world. The unbeliever doesn't want God. He wants a substitute God, or he claims no God exists. Take your pick, doesn't matter which one. He's going to be more incompetent. Now, Satan and company are also busy trying to sell their plan to the human race, which is a kind of utopianism, but everybody's idea of utopia differs, so they split, you know, if you if your idea of utopia is A, but the guy next to you, his idea of utopia is B, depending on what they can use you for or what use the other guy for, they're going to cater to your idea or the other guy's. 
And so everybody's going to form into little groups and everybody's going to fight with everybody else. That's what they're out to do. They're out to kill the human race. With kindness or battle, take your pick. They're very opportunistic. So your average Joe Blow who doesn't believe in Christ or believed once in his carnal is all in Satan's camp and is incompetent except for what they do to him too. See, you're always a product of somebody else. There's very little of you that's going into anything good that gets done. With God, all you've got is your thinking, and that he has to train if you want him to. And if you're not, well, then Satan's, been, Satan's got some demon assigned to you. You got a guardian angel and a guardian demon, at least one per if you're a believer. And if you're not, well, then it kind of depends upon how strategic you are to some goal they've got in mind. They've, they've got numerous tactical and strategic goals in mind. I covered that in LVS4.htm. That's a very long section. It's at least a thousand pages printed where I go through the strategy and the tactics and how they do what they do. The point is, is that you're incompetent the minute you are in a state of sin, but the unbeliever is really more incompetent than you. So what's holding this world together? Is God using the believers growing in him? And Satan and company very busily trying to do damage control. And we see that story in a lot of different places in the Bible, most notably like in Daniel 10, where God set up this deal where it was supposed to be like a hoplite thing. It was one angel on one angel. And so Gabriel was assigned to do that with whoever the demon angel was in Persia. And he had to wait until Michael relieved him. The translation, of course, is satanic of that passage, so it makes it look like God abandoned Gabriel. And everybody was, I was all alone by myself. That's not what it says. He was deployed. It was a one-on-one -on -one deal. Who knows what the terms of the trial were, you know, to generate that. So Daniel was on the outs during that period. Okay, and then Daniel was getting, you know, put back in. And that's what Daniel, you know, 10 is all about. And then he, you know, he, he doesn't last very long and he goes. You know, Daniel was around, I want to say, maybe a year after Darius the Mede died. Because Darius the Mede, um, the, the, the year that, I, I think it was the third, yeah, it should have been. Um, the year that Darius the Mede died was the beginning of Daniel's last year. He was returned to power and the beginning of his last year. The point is that God will strategically place the believer who's growing in him, not necessarily visibly like he did Daniel. He will also you know, being foreign, you know, having foreknowledge and all that. He also knows how the bad side is going to play amongst believers and how the incompetence is going to grow amongst those who don't believe in God. And he lets both play out. Incompetence is the hallmark characteristic of not being with God. But the demons play games. So you don't see that easily. And the other thing that, that you don't see is that there is also a competence of evil, which the demons are constantly feeding because they have to. Evil is self-destructive. Evil makes a person insane. And the insanity, of course, goes undetected. That's why a whole lot of smart people make such stupid mistakes. And... The objective is, God, at God's end, the objective is to show you all your alternatives. Here's what happens if you go with me. Here's what happens if you go against me. Okay? And you're blessed for going against God. 
You actually are. You're blessed by God and you're blessed by Satan and company. God will bless you because obviously you're so stupid to go against him. You need more time to live. Okay, and Satan and company want to bless you because you're doing what they want. But they'll drop you like a hot potato when the time comes. They use you just like, you know, Kleenex. Meanwhile, you're turning slowly insane the more you buy into their stuff. That's why anti-Semitism is the last stage of a person's, how do you want to call it, mental life. The competence um, of evil actually increases, but at the same time, so does the insanity, which eats into the competence of the evil. So the person basically, how do you want to call it, um, he's, he degenerates, he disintegrates, the soul literally disintegrates into an inability to, how do you want to call it? To recognize any kind of truth at all. Even when it's right standing in front of your face. I mean, here we have all these Muslims standing in front of our face with their insane book. There is no book that is more insane than the Quran. It's not coherent. It's rambling. And yet it's a genius book too. I, one day, I'll, uh, if I live long enough, I'm going to do a series on how you can see both. All these people are believing in this crazy book. And they're not dumb people. Muslims are usually pretty smart. And people in the Middle East in general tend to have a higher intelligence level. In the Middle East, India, all that. There is a higher... Um, how do you want to call it, a higher competency at putting two and two together, connecting the dots, and being practical about what to do. But there's also a higher insanity level because most of them generally don't believe in God. They believe in some substitute. All you have to do is look at people like that and see the juxtaposition of the beliefs that they have with their cleverness and you realize that th that it's an insanity, okay? That their that their actual ability to think is disintegrated, but the cleverness makes them very dangerous to deal with. So you have the problem of the Doctor Hyde, I mean the the Mister Hyde people in carnal Christendom. You have the problem also of the people who don't believe being aided and abetted by Satan and company as well in order to try to produce this, really they're aiming at Armageddon, but they're aiming at it through a, a panacea policy of getting everybody to, um, you know, fantasize a millennium and then they're all going to beat themselves up because, they all, you know, everybody's going to want to be top dog. You have those two things going on, so therefore the world is always in a state of flux. And what preserves it is God blessing the believer who's learning and living on Bible. Okay? That's what keeps it going. The idea from God's end is to allow the negative to have time to wake up and smell the coffee because they are slowly degenerating, because they are going insane, because evil has its self-destructive effects. But, you know, some people are so hung up on my mother, my brother, my bro father, my sister, my culture, my nation, my religion. Those are all evils. I mean, they're not ipse evil, but they're used that way. They're used for evil ends. So people have to wake up to see that. And when they don't, every once in a while, God just cleans house. That's what the flood was. Meanwhile, there's you and me, and are we individually, irrespective of what everybody else is doing, learning and living on Bible, because that pleases God to hear us think that way. And then as a result, we become more competent, which does help stave off the degeneration of the world. Not by much. What does it by much is God blesses the world to keep it going in spite of itself. Meanwhile, on the flip side, there is an increase in competency of evil 
at the same time it's destroying itself, which is manifest most strongly in anti-Semitism, which turns you into an animal. And, like I said, the Palestinians are examples of that. They've been like that now for 2,000 years. And it's basically their test for the whole human race to choose for or against the Jews. Also. So as you can see, there's this flip side to your competence. Not only in you when you turn into Mr. Hyde, but all these other Mr. Hydes who never have a Dr. Jekyll side. And the kind of there's a an anti competence of evil that lasts for a while, resulting in the person who's getting that increased competence of evil becoming more and more insane. And really on any given day the only reason the world is alive is because you and I are on it learning him. Because the insanity itself has to be micromanaged by Satan and company, or we'd all have killed each other by now. So bear all that in mind as you get into the next increment.